And so now we've gone through the um, videos of how the gearbox works, how the selector forks and drums work and how the um, gear shift mechanism works. What I wanted to go back to, and as you know I've cheated and put them videos in, edit them slightly, put them back into the se into the series. So we're on part 16, no, 15, whatever, anyway, I'll shut up for a second. What I've got is I've got the gearbox as it is, as, as you separate the cases, and the reason why I've done this is because putting back a gearbox together, especially if you've never done it, and you know, you're, you lack of confidence a bit in how it should be put back together, or how you, basically how you put it back together, can be a bit does this bit go there, does this bit go there, etc, etc. What you can do is uh, take loads of pictures, take loads of pictures and then mark each one as you take it off. So this is the front um, selector fork, these are the two rear ones, so you can write rear bottom, rear top, as long as you put it back together in this case. Uh, you can mark the case in, etc, just with a, you know, a white marker or something like that, a bit of chalk, whatever. And um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the gearbox out um, and record this, so basically it's just a, a reverse of this process. So if you're doing this yourself you can watch this a couple of times or you can use it as a review in aid or tool or whatnot. Um, so the first thing I ever do is, it's like I say, it'd be a reverse. So this is the last thing to go on um, and this is the second gear output shaft. It's got a little sleeve, put that back in the gear, the correct rotation. The dog recesses need to go obviously towards the dogs. Take your second gear uh, input shaft gear off, put that to one side. As you notice, these, apart from your movable gear, but this one is held in with this circlet. So obviously you can't take that off when you're reassembling. So the next thing I do is just try and lift the whole thing out. But before you do this, you need to take these two guide pins out. As you can see, the rear one is a lot bigger because it's got two forks on it, the front one's a lot shorter because it's got one fork on it. So you take them off, and then this whole thing you can remove the selector forks, you can remove the top one, that comes off. You can remove, you can't really remove the next one, but now it takes the selector drum out. If you undo the nut, um, the bolt on the back of the selector drum, you can take that out as well. Then you can take your movable gear off because the selector fork isn't in the way. And then hopefully you should be able to lift. Come on, you've got to lift them both together. And something is sticking. So if you turn the gearbox over, um, Obviously I'm disassembling, but this is the assembly process, so you put this circlet back on. And this circlet is a bitch. Oh, for God's sake. Oops, what the hell is that? Oh, they're good bloody circlet pliers. Pieces of shit. And yes, I know I've got the wrong ones. Do you know what, I'll stop and go and get the right so that's not going to bloody work, is it? There we go. Obviously doing the reverse, so you don't fire it on, like I've just fired it off. <laughs> you turn it over, and the shaft should move like it just did then. So this shaft wants to come, this shaft wants to come, and voila, just like that, so in two assemblies. And then you've left behind the movable gear and the forks, put that back on. And that's your first output shaft, first gear. Take that off, select a fork. And voila, you are left with an empty casing. So, what we can see inside the empty casing is absolute bugger all. You've got your big bearing, big roller bearing, you've got this needle bearing here for your output shaft, you've got your two recesses for your um, guide rods for your selector forks, you've got your selector drum. And obviously you take out your selector drum, or if you are doing that, you will um, put your selector drum back in. So what we'll do is we'll turn this over, 
And I've got this on two blocks of wood because everything protrudes lower than the machine surface. So you have your selector mechanism with your paw and everything else like that. And now that's the right size. We'll be back in a second because I'll use my socket set for something else. Oh, stop it. Grab your selector drum from the back. And you can't turn it. <laughs> so, there is a hollowed out hole on this selector drum. So, what I'm going to do is stick something in it. If I can find the screwdriver. Oh, no, I can't. This. Aha, it's a So, stick that in there. And uh, you select the drum, will come out. Now, just put this to one side for a second. I'm going to talk about the selector drums. Which I know we've already done, already covered, but I want to go through the design and layout of a selector drum. So the whole way a selector drum works is it has these these recess valleys inside, and these recess valleys on your selector fork, they have this little dog that sticks out that they ride inside. This is cast iron, this is hardened steel, and by the look of it, it's forged, it's a forged hardened steel fork. So, what we want to do is get our fantastic piece of paper out again, just ignore that for a second. And my pen, for some reason, it's up there. So, the way this works... Um, oh, one other thing as well is, a lot of these selector drums have um, a dowel in the end to align this to the um, star, the detent star that's on your selector that it was twisting as I was, you saw me undoing the nut, at uh, the bolt, sorry. And um, this aligns it with that, and as, as you notice, there's actually, ooh, like I say, don't lose it. Um, there's actually these other holes, but as you can see, they don't fit. It's there for a completely different purpose that I won't go into now. Um, so the way this works is you have this um, nearly 360 degree rotation as it goes around. So what we can do is we can plot that out. So uh, let me think. What we have is if we start at the start position. Now the start position is here. This is the start position. This little kick out. So what we have is we have um, there's the start. So we'll mark the start and then that's the finish. That's F for finish. You can't see that. You know what I'm doing. So this is the start, and that's the finish. So the start all I'm doing is just splitting it up into increments. Rough increments of say ten millimeters. Uh worked out alright. Right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've got nine increments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Can you see that? No, you can't see that. And it'll be upside down to you. Well done. <laughs> so we've got our one to two, uh, one to nine increments, like so. So on the first key, on the first um, channel, we have up here, and then we go down to here, like so, and then second, third, fourth, all the way to nine. So this is just a straight line to nine, like so. 
on the second channel the start is open and it goes all the way to the second increment so there and then it goes down down to the third down to the third up third, fourth, fifth so it goes up to the fifth and I'll explain something in a minute and then it goes down to the sixth and then it goes straight so there is a centre line so this is our centre line like so and you'd say that is your centre line here so this is our centre line like so so what you can see is that you have one, two, one, two, three, four, five. You have five positions there, and that correlates to our five gears. And what I mean by position changes is position changes from the center line. So here you have zero, that's not moving. Then you have one, then you have two, and then you have from the center line again three, and then you have one back down, which is four. So you'll have one position change, two, three, and four, and then there's one here outside the centre line, or you could call that the centre line. So you've got another um, one there, so you've got five positional changes. But what is important is how they move in respect to each other. So this bottom channel is for the two selector forks, but not the ones on the same side. This is for the, the first, the front one, and one of the back ones, and I think it's the top back one. So here it's engaging one and disengaging another as it goes so that's your five positional changes and like i say this is over it's not over 360 degrees it's just shy of 300 well it's it's just shy i'd say 260. so this is over a 260 degree rotation and um over them 260 degrees, you get these following movements. Now you might think to yourself, well hang about, nothing's happening here. Why is there all this space? That is literally um, the added degrees to 360 comes over to here. So this isn't part of our selector. That's just open space. And that's this section here in the middle where there's nothing and then this just rolls, they might as well carry on, there's no reason to stop it. The other thing is as well is one starts in here and one starts over here because of the nature of the selector drum. So you need this open channel because there's just one fork riding on here then you don't need it. So this is how you plot out your um, selection or this is how they design and plot out their selection for their selector forks. And if you had a six, you know, you'd have a um, just another position where you'd have number one moves into um, fifth gear so you'd probably have one that come off here at this location or you'd have it come off this direction depending which way you wanted the actually no sorry it wouldn't be that it'd be this because you want it to move the opposite direction this is moving and engaging one way this hand then has to get engaged the other way so your selector drum on a six gear and six speed would be like this um, but there's all this space, so you could have seven or eight gears if you wanted to, but there's not really any reason or purpose for that. So that's um, select drum design and um, architecture, that's what I'd probably call it, it's the architecture of the uh, selector drum. So.